Chapter One of Night of Molokai. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Treese. Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. Chapter One Early Days. August, Leonce, are you ready? Yes, Mother. Eugenie and Pauline, you have the lunch basket packed? Yes, Mother. Gerard, Constance, Marie, one of you is looking after Joseph. This time there was silence, as three of the de Booster children looked guiltily at each other. I thought you, began Constance, but Mother told you, broke in Marie. The two sisters turned on their brother. After all, he's a boy, said Constance, as Marie nodded agreement. It would seem as if you... Oh, stop blaming each other, exclaimed their mother. Go look for him and see that he's not into some mischief, which he probably is, she added under her breath. I don't see why that boy need always be doing what he mustn't. It was not that Joseph was a naughty boy, not at all. He was agreeable and honest and obedient. But, too, he was a strong, healthy five-year-old with a very active mind, which could always think of new projects and activities. He seldom did what he had been told not to do, but poor Mrs. de Wooster sometimes felt that if she hoped to have him stay out of trouble, she would have to tell him to do nothing but sit still. And to sit still would, of course, have been quite impossible for Joseph. Today she had little time for repairing torn clothing or doctoring bruises and cuts. The fair, or kermis, as it is called in Belgium, had opened in the nearby town of Worcester, and the whole family was going to it for a day of pleasure. Mr. de Wooster was a thrifty man. It was necessary with such a large family, but he was also a generous father, and the children felt sure that after they had eaten the hearty meal brought from home, they would have treats of cakes and sweet drinks, and perhaps the girls could each buy a bright ribbon for her hair. The boys, too, would each have a gift. They all stood breathless in the big kitchen, waiting for Gerard to find and bring in what they felt sure would be a dirty, disheveled Joseph. If he was too dirty, too disheveled, there would be a delay while he was tidied up, and their father did not like being kept waiting. He was even now hitching the horses to the wagon, which would carry them all to the Kermes. And no Joseph! Just as the big wagon left the barn and rumbled across the yard which separated from the house, Gerard burst into the house with Joseph, an amazingly unexpectedly clean Joseph by the hand. The girls beamed at each other and at their mother. Doesn't he look nice? they chorused. He's a good boy. Where did you find him, Gerard? asked Mrs. de Wooster. He was sitting on a big stone under the tree, just sitting and doing nothing. Joseph looked solemnly around the group, rolling his great dark eyes from one to the other. I was so doing something, he said at last. I was telling my angel to tell your angels to take care of you today and not let you get lost. How about you? Is there no fear that you'll get lost? asked Leonce, suppressing a smile. No, of course not. My angel always takes care of me. The family hurried out without comment as Mr. de Wooster reined the big Flemish horses before the door. The children boosted their mother up to the high seat beside her husband. Then the older boys climbed into the back of the wagon to give the girls and Joseph a helping hand. The little boy snuggled down beside Pauline, his favorite, and listened wide-eyed as she described the color and fun and excitement they would find at the fair. There will be music and singing and dancing, she explained, and a puppet theater, perhaps, and many other interesting things to see, and perhaps some special treats to eat. Joseph wriggled closer, anxious not to miss a single detail of this wonderland. Some people will be dressed in funny clothes, and they will play jokes on the others. There will be acrobats, too, people who do wonderful tricks, she explained, realizing that the word acrobat wouldn't mean much to her little brother. Will they all be nice people? asked Joseph. All our neighbors will be there, and many others, Pauline answered. Perhaps we will see Grandfather de Wooster, too. Joseph's eyes shone. There was a particular friendship between his grandfather and himself, and they understood and enjoyed each other very much. The other children all joined in the story, telling what they had heard of fairs in other places, wondering what new amusements this one would offer. There would be swings and games of skill 
and the big boys boasted a little about what they would accomplish if given the chance. Your aim is very good, Gerard assured Leonce. You can throw darts against anyone. I have a stronger arm. I'll do better if we throw balls. Leonce agreed to both statements, and they went off into a discussion of their own feats and those of various friends while the girls talked of the ribbons and laces and linens which would be displayed. Little Joseph drowsed off, while these, to him, uninteresting conversations were going on. When they were still some distance from the streets given over to the fair, the sound of music and shouting and laughter floated over the low hills to meet them. The excitement seemed to touch the very horses, and with no urging from Mr. de Wooster, they hurried a little faster along the cobbled road flashing by the people who traveled afoot on the dusty paths bordering the highway. "'Wake up, Joseph! Wake up! We're nearly there!' Pauline roused the sleeping boy and brushed his hair back from his forehead. He bounced up and down on the floor of the wagon, hardly able to wait until the horses were driven into the field where they were to be left. "'These good friends will have their dinner first, said Mr. de Wooster, hitching his team under a wide-spreading tree. He reached under the front seat and drew out two leather nose bags, each containing a generous measure of oats. Then he loosened the horses' girths and took off their bridles, replacing them with loose halters, which allowed the animals to feed easily from the bags he now fastened to their heads. While he was so busied, Mrs. de Wooster opened the lunch basket. The children watched with eager eyes as the goodies were taken out and placed on a white cloth Marie had spread on a level patch of ground. Mr. de Wooster said grace, and between hunger and excitement the meal vanished as if by magic. "'When we get to the Kermes,' directed Mr. de Wooster, "'we will stay together as long as we can. But the crowd is large and all intent on seeing everything, so we are sure to be forced apart. However, you older children will keep a firm grip on the hands of the little ones to make certain they don't get lost.' He looked about to be sure his words were understood, and then, guiding them in front of him as a shepherd does his sheep, he marched proudly beside his wife into the streets of Kermis. Pauline and Joseph were soon separated from the rest of the family, for the little boy was startled by the noise and clamor and hung back from the crowd in confusion. Music to him had meant the singing of his family and their friends, or the little organ in the church, and not the loud, brassy clangor of the wandering bands of musicians. The people in funny clothes, of whom Pauline had spoken, he had pictured as looking like himself and his brothers and sisters when they played games at home. Here they were dwarfs and clowns with grotesque costumes and painted faces which frightened him, and the pushing crowd. He felt lost in a moving sea of legs. He tried bravely to keep his dismay to himself, but when a passer-by playfully hit him with a bladder fastened on the end of a stick, the action and the loud pop upset Joseph completely. He jerked his hands from his sisters and wriggled his way through the masses of people, intent on one thing only, to get away from these terrifying merrymakers. It happened so quickly that before Pauline was fully aware of the fact that her little brother's hand was no longer in hers, he had disappeared from her sight, swallowed up in a sea of strangers. She called, but hardly hoped that he would hear her over the din, or that he would, or could, find his way back to her. She turned, and with what speed was possible, followed in the direction she believed he had taken. But the hardy, pleasure-seeking people could not understand why anyone should be hurrying through the Kermis. A pretty girl, will you dance with me? Little lady, don't go so fast. Let me show you the ribbons I have for sale. Pretty ribbons for a pretty miss. Pauline, a neighbor this time, is your family here? And how is your dear mother? Everyone was determined to stop her. And all the while, Joseph, her charge, her dear little brother, was getting farther away. She was almost in tears when she saw two of her older brothers coming toward her. Leonce! Gerard! They didn't hear her frantic call. She tried again, even louder. Gerard! Leonce! This time they caught her voice pronouncing their names, though they could not tell from what quarter it came. Here I am! Here! I must see you! The boys spotted her and good-naturedly made their way over to where she stood, believing she had some amusing tale for them but her distraught face told a different story, even before she spoke. "'I've lost Joseph!' she burst out as soon as they were near enough to hear her. A few quick questions and a simple plan, and the boys were off. Pauline was to remain in front of the puppet theater, where she had been when Joseph pulled away. The boys would make a circle of the streets, alerting any of the family or any friends they might meet on the way. 
They would come back to Pauline to report at intervals, and when the child was found, he would be brought there. It seemed a lifetime before Leonce hurried back, looking at Pauline across the heads of the crowd, and when she shook her head, sped down another lane. Gerard followed before long, and shortly afterward her parents, whose worried faces made Pauline feel even more unhappy. Joseph was such a little boy, and the crowd, though kind-hearted enough, was apt to be rough. Oh, why hadn't she held his hand more tightly? In spite of her fierce efforts to hold them back, tears welled up into her eyes. Her vision blurred. She was not aware of the approach of her grandfather, and started when he spoke to her. What are you doing here, alone and forsaken? he asked jokingly. I've lost Joseph. Like a cascade, the story poured out. Nonsense! Joseph isn't lost, broke in the old man gruffly. Have you seen him? No, I haven't, but I know where he is, and so should you. Keep your family here as they arrive, and I'll be back soon. The square-shouldered old man pushed his way through the crowd and hurried down the street. Mr. and Mrs. de Wooster and all the children were grouped around Pauline, when suddenly she cried out, There's Joseph! Sure enough, there was Joseph, his head high above the crowd, as he rode placidly on his grandfather's shoulder. Joseph, cried Mrs. de Wooster, where have you been? Why did you run away? We were so worried when you were lost. I wasn't lost, mother, said Joseph. My angel was with me, and I didn't run away. I was afraid of the people and the noise, so I went to God's house. His grandfather nodded. Where else would he be but in church, he asked. In the northwestern, or flemish part of Belgium, in which the de Boosters lived, farming was hard. The soil was thin and sandy, and the growing season short. Every pair of hands was needed in the daily work. Even little Joseph helped with the weeding and cultivating, and his sturdy legs ran many miles, fetching and carrying for the older ones, whose strength was more needed at the heavier tasks. He fed the chickens and kept their water pans filled, and if he sometimes jumped astride a stick, and in the role of a crusader chased the screaming hens, Syracans, flying in all directions. The creatures soon forgot and continued their business of supplying the family with eggs. At regular periods, Mr. de Wooster went to market with the grain from his fields. On those days, as a rule, the children worked doubly hard, not only because the strongest, most capable pair of hands was missing, but because they were unsupervised, and honesty compelled them to do what they might otherwise shirk. At the close of such a day, Mrs. de Wooster would settle down and read to her boys and girls, stories from the lives of the saints, tales of the crusades. Joseph, quiet for a change, was always the most attentive. The stories he particularly enjoyed and asked for most often were the ones which told of the saints who lived alone in forest or desert hermits who prayed to their maker in solitude. It was an odd choice, Mrs. de Wooster felt, for such a friendly, active little boy. One day Mr. de Wooster went into Antwerp with his grain. The aunt and Gerard apportioned the day's tasks and the family scattered to their various duties. Mrs. de Wooster was busy in the house. She was surprised at mid-morning to hear a knocking at the door, for she knew that all her neighbors were as busy as she, and would not come calling at such an hour. Straightening her neat white cap and apron, she went to see who the visitor might be. "'Good morning, Mrs. de Wooster,' said the boy who had rapped. "'Is my little brother Thomas here?' Mrs. de Wooster was surprised. "'Why, no.' I thought he might be playing with Joseph. They are such good friends. Joseph is not playing this morning, Bernard, explained Mrs. de Wooster. My husband has gone to the grain market, and all the children are at work in the fields. Is Thomas lost? Well, perhaps he is around our place, though I couldn't find him. He was supposed to help me clean the barn, but when it came time to start, he was nowhere in sight. But it's a job he doesn't like much, and he may just be hiding. I'll look again, and thank you. Somewhat later in the morning, a woman hurried to the de Wooster door. "'I'm looking for my Anna. Is she here?' she asked breathlessly. "'No, Mrs. Vinkick, she isn't. I thought perhaps she was playing with Joseph,' the neighbor explained. "'All the children like being with him. He's a real leader, that boy.' "'No, I'm sorry. Bernard was just here, too, looking for his little brother. But I explained to him that all my flock are working in the fields today.' While the two women were still conferring, a farmer from farther down the road drove up, looking for his two small children. By this time, all three adults knew that something odd was afoot. "'I'll call Joseph in from the field,' offered Mrs. de Wooster. "'He may have heard them making plans for the day.' 
Stepping toward the door, she picked up a mallet and struck several blows on a piece of iron which hung suspended near the door. It gave off a high, clear sound that carried far over the fields. The Rooster children came running from several directions. It surely can't be noon yet. What's the matter? Is there trouble? No, no trouble, assured their mother. Then her face clouded a little. Where's Joseph? Was he not with you? Not with me, nor me, nor me. Mrs. de Wooster shook her head and turned to her visitors. I suppose your children are with Joseph, she said, but where that would be I could not guess. I'm sorry. I won't worry if Anna is with Joseph, said Mrs. Vinnick. He is not reckless. They'll be home when it's noon and they're hungry, said the farmer. But noon and mid-afternoon and finally early evening came and still no Joseph. Mrs. de Wooster was first resigned and then annoyed. When it was nearly dark she began to be fearful. But before she could take any action, she spied first one, then a second, then three, four, five little figures plodding down the steep side of a wood-topped hill. It was Joseph with a train of four other small children. Joseph, she called and ran toward him. Where have you been? Is that Anna with you? And Thomas? And? I told them about Hermes, mother, the ones you read about who got to be saints. We decided that we wanted to be saints. So first we were going to be hermits and live on fruits and berries. But we didn't bring much fruit, added Thomas, and we couldn't find any berries. And I didn't like living in a hollow tree when it got dark, put in Anna. We'll be hermits and saints later on, I guess, said Joseph. Mrs. de Wooster sighed and called her older boys to see the other children safely to their homes. Her own small visionary she fed and put to bed. End of chapter one. Recording by Maria Treese.